and welcome back to Talk Business and Politics. I'm Roby Brock. Joined now by our, for our Talk Politics Roundtable, we have Jessica deloach Saban, a Democratic strategist, Robert Kuhn, a Republican strategist, the Impact Management Group. Good to have both of you with us. Thank you. All right. Let's roll through some poll numbers that we have been diving into for the last couple of weeks. Let's begin with President Trump's declining approval number in Arkansas. Robert, are you surprised? You know, not necessarily. Obviously, there's been quite a bit of turmoil and a lot of drama uh, at the White House as of late. Um, as of late? For yeah, six well, months, Well, for man. six months, but, you know, you've had quite a bit of turnover. You know, the people don't like to see instability. They don't want to feel like things are not on solid footing. Uh, you know, possibly getting some replacements in the chief of staff role that can bring some stability would be a solution there. But uh, not all that surprising. I think you also have to remember that, you know, his his numbers are, are one thing in a vacuum compared to someone else. That's a different story. Yeah. All right, Jessica, what about you? You've seen it go from 6035 in right. February to 5047 in, uh, in July. That has to... Uh, empower Democrats. Well, it does, but you also have to remember that people who were very, very loyal to him, the number, his approval is much higher among those people. You know, there's been a lot of debate about what's driving these numbers down, and a lot of people will say, oh, it's just the overall chaos of things. I don't think that that's the case. I think what's really driving these numbers down is the lack of anything getting done. I think that you have a lot of Republicans and the president himself who ran on this platform of we're going to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, and they didn't. Yeah. On multiple attempts. They have not done so. And so I think that that's been a tremendous letdown to people who wanted to see that happen. And now they probably feel like there's an absence of leadership and they're right for thinking so. Is that part of the chaos, though, of the, the last several months yeah, that they haven't gotten things done? It's probably twofold. I think you've probably got some folks even on the Republican side that are disappointed in, the, in some of the you know, things that they were hoping that would get done early that haven't been done yet. But I think you've still also got some folks that, that thought that the show and the campaign was going to be the show and that they would transist to, you know, being able to, to accomplish some things. And they're probably getting a little frustrated, too, of not seeing, you know, the, the deliverance of a lot of those issue-based things that they were hoping for. I think another thing that I see a narrative that is developing, too, is the way that Congress is pushing back on this president mm -hmm. a little bit. We've got the sanctions bill that we've seen. Uh, certainly, we're going to see a bipartisan approach to health care now. Senator bon John Bozeman tells me earlier in the program that, um, that he thinks there'll be a bipartisan approach to tax reform, which is news to me. Uh, you see them uh, not allowing recess appointments for the president when they go on their August recess here. Do you think that perhaps he is becoming a unifying force for the institution of Congress? Well, that would make all of this make sense, that finally you found one thing that can unify Congress, and it's just <laughs> terrible leadership in the White House. So I think that it's encouraging to hear John Bozeman say that it's going to take both sides coming to the table, because if anything, the lesson, the takeaway from the failed attempts at reforming health care in this country or our policies is that you have to have both sides. A majority can't do it all, as we've now seen. I'm not saying there's a guarantee that both oh, sides know, have been there. I'm, I'm just hopeful. saying that's what their uh, push is, <laughs> Robert. Yeah, you know, I think some of that's related to the White House. I think, you know, some of it's related to the fact that you have such a slim majority in the Senate. I mean, they they, they used health care as kind of that test case to see if they could put their own thing out there and get it through. Obviously, it didn't happen. Uh, so it may be more of a realistic, you know, let's step back and figure out what we can actually accomplish uh, so it might not be as much White House as it is just, you know, being real about how you get there and how you get the votes. All right, I'm coming to you first on this, Robert Kuhn. Uh, the congressional reelect numbers that we had in our poll here show that like 58 percent are open to another candidate, only 36 percent very certain that they will vote for uh, their incumbent Republican congressman. Is there something in the water in Arkansas politics? You know, I wouldn't say so. I, I tend to think when you're when you're not using you know named ballot candidates, it's hard to really test that. Um, you know, obviously you're you're trying to get a sense of the broader mood, and so I think it gives you a little bit of insight just in kind of the frustration. But it's kind of the same thing. You know, when you ask people if they like Congress, they always say, "Of course not." And then you ask if they like their congressman, and they say, "Of course so." So, you know, I don't think it, I think it's kind of hard to put too much stock in that. Um, I mean, maybe you can see just some frustration with Washington there, but I don't think it's indicative of any, you know, uh, footing that any of our members have. Yeah. What do you, what do you, what's your sense on that? Well, I think it's very encouraging for Arkansas Democrats in certain areas of the state. Now, I think that those numbers, you know, Robert just made this great point about, you know, you have a generic 
no name, whatever, and then you have a person's name. And, and people do relate to their congressman. So I think that uh, you're going to have to have the Democratic Party put up some very strong candidates mm -hmm. in some of these areas. But I also think the other consideration to make is what the Republican Party pushes in terms of policy next and how well those things go. Are they going to have any achievements this year at all? Right now, the answer is no. And if they don't, I think people are going to push back on that. And you're going to see that here in the state. I mean, those numbers that you just stated, that's kind of exceptional if you think about how red this state is or that we know it to be. And now we've seen that there's an opening and I think Democrats would be smart to seize it. Well, we'll see about messaging from both political parties will be uh, key for next year. All right, we gotta take a quick commercial break. We're gonna come back more with Robert Kuhn and Jessica deloach Saban right after this. Welcome back to our Talk Politics Roundtable. I'm Roby Brock with Jessica deloach Saban and Robert Kuhn, two talk business and politics contributors. All right, we're, uh, you remember when you were a kid and you played the game of concentration, you had to figure out where cards were and you turned them over and you had to match them up? Well, we're going to do that. I've got uh, some paper in front of you and Jessica. I'm going to let you turn over first. There's a headline on the other side of that paper, and that's what we're going to talk about. Great. Turn it over and read it. Okay. John Kelly sworn in as President Trump's second chief of staff. All right. How significant is this development that uh, within six months, Reince Priebus, the former leader of the Republican Party, out a general into that place in the White House now? Key word being general, right? Because it's not uncommon for there to be a replacement of a chief of staff along the way. Now, granted, this is a little early and things have not or did not go well under uh, the former chief of staff's tenure. But John Kelly could be a person who brings order to the White House. My favorite thing right now is knowing that there is no information that's supposed to be going to the president before it goes through although, Kelly first. Although a transcript <laughs> of some conversations between the president and the Australian prime minister and the Mexican president Kelly leaked can, out immediately. He can so, only do so much. Right. Look, I mean, it's, it's which whole... We're talking about going in, not coming out, right? <laughs> right, right. So there's also that, yeah. What, what, what does that say about Ryan Priebus, really an establishment Republican being pushed out of the White House? Is Donald Trump pivoting to more independent? Well, here, here's what I think of. I think I think Reince was kind of dealt a very difficult hand. I think in a lot of ways what you had there was an arranged marriage of the establishment <laughs> coming in and saying we want to be in the room and we want to help kind of keep tabs on you. Um, you know, it's I don't think it has anything to do with Reince or his capabilities. I think it had to do with just it's a terrible it's a terrible marriage to put together. Um, I think what plagues this White House the most is uh, kind of the individualism you have throughout it at the staff level, people trying to self-promote themselves. Uh, everybody's clawing to get higher and backbiting each other. I think that General Kelly is the right person to try to sort that out, to put some real infrastructure in there, to put a chain of command in a literal way in there where you know folks aren't focusing on themselves and they're focused on the job at hand. Yeah, this is gonna be an interesting test case here. All right, turn over your card there and we have. President Trump holds West Virginia rally. Democratic governor announces he's switching parties. Well, he was a Republican before he was a Democrat, before he was a Republican. So, yeah. But let's talk about that Trump rally right there. What was your takeaway from that Trump rally? That was some red meat for the base there. It is, and this is the kind of thing that Donald Trump does well. I mean, putting on the show, we saw it during the campaign. You still see it today. I think whenever you know things get a little wobbly in the White House, he's always apt to go throw a rally, do something like this. I think that's where he feels at home. It, it fits within what he's done career-wise and on, on TV. So um, it is red meat for the base. There's still a movement of people that, that look to him. And, oh, I saw and, one of the guys you know, behind him there cheering him on. He's, he was classic. He so. still has it at the people. You know, d Despite what people see on the news, you know, there's still a, a, an undercurrent out there of support. So we can't lose sight of the, the people, how the, a lot of the people really feel. Jessica, why is he still running against Hillary Clinton? Because that's literally the only thing he knows how to do. It's the only thing that he actually has control over when he's in front of people. I mean, if you, if you look at these rallies, none of them are any different from the last one we've seen. These, this red meat that you throw out, every president does that in one way or another. It just, it just so happens to be the way he chooses to do it is a little over the top. I think as far as the, uh, the governor, the West Virginia governor, changing his party affiliation, I think that that's not even news. It's 
unsurprising, <laughs> and it's it's sad for him, and it's sad for the Democratic Party in West Virginia because he kept saying the Democratic Party left me. Well, you were never a part of it. And also, too, it was pretty cowardly to not speak to the Democratic Party of your state and to try to figure out what can be done better if the Democratic Party has left you behind. So I think, again, this is just more people looking out for themselves and their own political longevity, which is exactly what Donald Trump is doing when he hosts these rallies. All right. Give you a chance for one last comeback if you want to. Well, I mean, I think party switching is hard anytime it happens. Um, you know, it, everybody wants to criticize, you know, the person that does it. But, you know, typically that stuff is, is a blip in, in the pan and then goes away. It's not All right. We've got about 60 seconds left here. I will pull up the last one here. Special counsel Robert Mueller in panel's grand jury in Trump-Russia probe. This is a big development. It is a big development. It will be a very interesting to me to see, you know, where this goes. I do think that we're finally going to see some sunlight break through in all of this and maybe make some sense of where things are headed and, you know, sort out the noise from the truth. I think that we're finally headed in the right direction on this, and I can't wait to see what happens. Grand juries don't usually end up with them dissolving and nobody uh, getting indicted. Right. They'll, they'll have a lot more authority turning over rocks and looking for things. Uh, obviously, you already had a grand jury out there with Mike Flynn. I think, um, you know, there was clearly some Russian involvement. Whether or not it's coordinated, don't know, but they were definitely, you know, involved. I think probably a lot of this is going to be looking at Paul Manafort, but who knows how, how close it gets to the White House. All right. It'll give us more to talk about, though, yeah. in, the, in the coming weeks here. Robert Kuhn and Jessica Deloach Saban, as always, great stuff. Good to have y'all with us. Thank you. Thanks. I haven't seen y'all in a while. Good to I see you. That is all for today's program. Thank you so much for tuning in. Have a busy and a productive week. I'm Robbie Brock. We'll see you next time.